The third reaction is phosphofructokinase. This is the committed step in glycolysis. It's kind of a big deal. It is the second priming reaction of glycolysis. So this is also going to utilize and use another ATP molecule. So in part because we are going ahead and putting in that additional energy, but also for some other reasons, this is going to be a big step. Uh, it's got a large negative delta G value to go with this. It's also highly regulated, which is why it gets its own video. ATP is going to inhibit this and AMP will reverse that inhibition. This should make sense when you think about it. ATP is a high energy molecule. AMP is a low energy molecule. So when we have a lot of ATP, that's going to tell the cell that we have enough energy. We don't need to spend more energy in breaking down more glucose. Citrate is also going to be an allosteric inhibitor, uh, which will actually link us between glycolysis and the citric acid cycle or that TCA cycle. So what that is going to do is essentially kind of tell you when something's backed up. So when citrate levels are high, that essentially means that the TCA cycle is full of stuff. Uh, and again, it's kind of allowing that negative feedback loop. Fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is also going to be an allosteric activator. We'll talk more about that uh, both in this video and later when we get to gluconeogenesis, it'll come back. Overall, when the energy status is low, PFK is going to be activated. It's going to have increased levels of activity because the more we can break down glucose, the more energy we can get out of it. Phosphofructokinase activity is going to decrease when energy status is high. So when the cell has a lot of energy, it's not going to want to spend energy, even those little priming reactions, into breaking down more glucose. It's got the energy it needs. It doesn't need more. So looking at what this actually is. So we're starting off with fructose 6-phosphate plus a molecule of ATP. And this is going to give us uh, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So it is that second priming reaction. It's going to, the ATP will be consumed. But this is, again, so that we can get more ATP produced further down the line. And there you can actually see the negative delta G uh, value. Here's our structure. The ADP molecule is in orange and the fructose 6-phosphate is in red. Phosphofructose kinase is going to behave cooperatively at high levels of ATP. So as we've talked about before, when we do have cooperativity, even though this sounds like a good thing, remember this is actually going to have our enzyme not work as well. So having ATP introduces that sigmoidal shape to the curve, which is going to have our phosphofructokinase not work as well. So in low ATP, we've got that beautiful hyperbolic curve where things are activated and working very, in a very high active manner. One of the things that uh, this picture doesn't actually show you as well as I'd like it to is phosphofructokinase is actually a tetramer. So in doing that, there's actually multiple binding sites for ATP. Uh, it's got an active site not only for the ATP that's going to use as a substrate to have the reaction work, but it also has a low affinity regulatory site. So there's actually two different binding affinities, a very high affinity um, value for the one where it's acting as a substrate and a lower affinity value for the regulation site. So a reminder, the way we actually get AMP is the cell will usually take molecules of ADP, which are actually shown here on the right, uh, and go ahead and basically swap around those phosphates so that what you get is you get one molecule of ATP and one molecule of AMP. So AMP is basically showing that the cell's energy uh, reserves are getting relatively low because what the cell's doing is it's basically utilizing the ADP it's got to combine it to make more ATP. So whenever those ATP levels go down, you're going to see more levels of AMP go up. Uh, and it's this adenyl adenylate uh, kinase that actually does that reaction. So it should make sense then that our phosphofructokinase activity is going to depend on both ATP and AMP. So both of these molecules will actually interact with phosphofructokinase. AMP to help stimulate and raise the activity, ATP to inhibit. Phosphofructokinase is activated by fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. So as we look at this, uh, realize that this is not the same thing as the 2,6-bisphosphoglycerate, the 2,6-BPG that we were talking about when we were looking at uh, hemoglobin. While yes, it still has two phosphate groups, um, that's the, the only thing it's got. The other one is 2,3-BPG. Uh, this is fructose 2,6-BP. 
So yes, I know with all the acronyms, they get very similar, but they are in fact different. So fructose 2,6-bisphosphate uh, is going to activate phosphofructokinase. Uh, what this is essentially going to do is this is actually going to override uh, any of the high energy signals that the uh, phosphofructokinase might have gotten from high levels of ATP. Because what this is actually going to do is whenever the cell has too much glucose, um, it's going to actually help activate phosphofructokinase to essentially try to help get rid of some of the glucose. Uh, and uh, fructose 2,6 uh, bisphosphate is one of the molecules that can basically be a, hey, by the way, we have too much sugar. We need to get rid of this somehow, some way. And apparently storing things as glycogen is not going fast enough. So whenever the glucose in the liver is high, you're going to see more of this fructose. Um, you'll see more of the fructose 6-phosphate, which will then activate the enzyme that makes fructose 2,6 bisphosphate. So this is technically a feed forward regulation. So we've talked about things being um, negative feedback loops. This is actually a feed forward mechanism, where if you have a lot of glucose, this will actually spur this to go forward. The other thing that this is going to do, and we'll talk more about it when we get to gluconeogenesis, is that this is also going to keep the catabolic pathway open. So basically what it's saying is that there's so much glucose that the catabolic pathway, the pathway that breaks down glucose, is the one that needs to stay activated. The other pathway that can be activated is gluconeogenesis, which would then create glucose and would synthesize glucose. So part of the advantage of having this particular regulatory step, even though you're like, but we have so much energy, we don't need to make more energy, but this is keeping the catabolic process available and saying, hey, we already have plenty of glucose. We don't need any more glucose. So this is also going to help keep the anabolic pathway from happening. As you might imagine by their structure, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate doesn't bind at the same place that ATP does. So because of that, you can actually uh, get the fructose 2,6-bisphosphate to essentially counteract the ATP signal. So it'll actually decrease the inhibitory effects of ATP. So what you have here on the graph is, is that on our x-axis, you have increasing amounts of ATP. Uh, and you've got the relative velocity on the y-axis. And what's happening is as you increase the amount of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, you also see the relative velocity. You see the activity of the phosphofructose kinase uh, also going up. 